All right, Casey, you're all set. Hi, everyone. Give me a moment just to figure out the technology. Uh -huh. Okay, can everyone see the presentation? Yep. Okay, perfect. So it's really nice to be with you all this afternoon. I'm Casey Lane, and I'm a newer psychologist at PSM. I started back in April. Uh, throughout this presentation, I'm going to be sharing about emerging adulthood. We'll talk about de developmental challenges and treatment considerations. I was noticing that uh, Michael talked to the postdocs on Friday about college students, I believe. So I imagine for you all, there's like a bit of a foundation laid for this talk. Um, but I hope it can be informative. Um, there's going to be a good bit of time at the end for us to talk and share and reflect on what you learn. Um, and please feel free to ask questions of me at the end too, if I can be helpful. Um, so let's get started. Um, so I'm going to start by reviewing our learning objectives for today. Uh, we will define emerging adulthood to inform assessment and case conceptualization using a developmental framework. We will increase knowledge of the developmental tasks and self-knowledge goals of emerging adulthood. We will identify strategies to help clients who may be experiencing distress associated with this period and consider how to promote resilience. So knowing the diversity of our group, I can imagine that there are a range of experiences and interests in working with emerging adult clients. Uh, I'd like to hear a little bit more from you as we move along. Um, I'll ask your participation uh, at a few points, and then at the end, we'll talk more together about what your takeaways are and how this might impact your work moving forward. Okay. So first, uh, why talk about emerging adults? Um, I think that this is both to share something about me and something about emerging adulthood. At the start of my time at PSM, Lauren proposed that I do a brown bag and that it could be an introduction of sorts. Um, while it's now several months later, I'm happy to share a bit about myself and my work. Uh, emerging adults are really the primary population with whom I've worked throughout much of my training and as a licensed psychologist. I spent a lot of time working in college counseling and really focusing on college mental health. This topic also is a bit of a nod to my interest in developmental psychology, which really started my path toward clinical psychology. It also reflects my frequent use of a developmental framework to ground my clinical work. And putting together this presentation, I couldn't help but reflect on how I really started working with emerging adults as an emerging adult. Um, and I think that providing therapy at this time really helped me understand myself and helped me understand my clients. I think you can hear that there's like a lot of passion for working with this population that I hold. I think that there is something really important about emerging adulthood because it's a critical period of life that entails many life transitions there's changes in living arrangements, relationships, education, and employment. And because of this, it can generate a lot of stress and psychological distress. I think that talking about this developmental period helps us as clinicians understand what is a typical part of this development during this period. So I'm gonna move on and just share a quote that I really appreciate and one that I'll have you hold throughout our time together today. This quote is from Jeffrey Jensen Arnett. To be a young American today is to experience both excitement and uneasiness, wide open possibilities and confusion, new freedoms and new fears. So that quote from Jeffrey Jensen Arnett really grounds us. Um, it's really his work that we think about or at least I think about when I think about emerging adulthood. Uh, Jeffrey Jensen Arnett is a developmental psychologist and his work is really the foundation of what my talk will be today. It's the key theory I'll overview, 
and it's something that was introduced to me early during my training. Um, while it has some criticism, I find it to be a very useful lens when working with my clients. So let's get into the theory a little bit by talking about sort of its foundation. Um, a little over 10 years ago, Arnett set out to conduct a cross-sectional research study to understand young Americans. His primary research question was, what are the distinctive features of this age group? He conducted 300 interviews with young Americans aged 18 to 29 in the late 90s and the early 2000s. These individuals were from varied ethnic, socioeconomic, and educational backgrounds. I think I highlight this here to say that um, these individuals were not just college students, um, and that was really important. Uh, this research was then followed by national surveys, each of about 1,000 18 to 29 year olds in 2012, 2013, and 2014. This research came out of Clark University during our next time there. And it really was to help more deeply understand this population. From all of his research, Arnett came to a general conclusion, which was emerging adulthood is a proposed developmental cohort to be studied, supported, and understood. I really appreciate that Arnett, like me, seems to have a love for this population and really wants us to understand how special it is to be with and work with emerging adults. So let me talk a little bit more about emerging adulthood as a distinctive developmental period. So to frame our next theory of emerging adulthood, I think it's important to understand that his theory serves as more descriptive than exploitatory. It describes who emerging adults, emerging adults are, and it describes what it is about emerging adulthood that makes it a distinct developmental period. So who are emerging adults? Emerging adults are age, are individuals age 18 to 25 conservatively or 18 to 29. And this range is really due to the variation and the subjective sense about what it means to be an adult. And this is something that we'll discuss together later. Emerging adulthood is not adolescence and it's not adulthood. Arnett argues that emerging adulthood is both theoretically and empirically distinct. Emerging adulthood is the most heterogeneous life stage. And emerging adulthood is a time of change, exploration, possibility, and importance. Arnett shares that having left the dependency of childhood and adolescence, and having not yet taken on the responsibilities that are normative in adulthood, emerging adults engage in identity exploration, a process of trying out life possibilities. And that's really at the core, and we'll talk more about this later too. So then the question comes like, why does this period, why does emerging adulthood occur? Arnett would argue that emerging adulthood can be found whenever the arrival of full-fledged adulthood is delayed. In the US, it's attributed to cultural changes, including the rise of the age of marriage and individuals entering parenthood later, from participation in longer and more widespread education, and from a longer time of transition into stable work. While time limits a full discussion, all of these came out of four revolutions, according to Arnett. The first is the technology revolution in the US, including a move away from manufacturing-based economy. The sexual revolution, including the introduction of the birth control pill. The women's movement. And then finally, and most importantly, the youth movement. And this movement really spurred a sense that Adulthood and moving into adulthood was less valuable and had less prestige. And thus there was something about this experience of delaying adulthood to explore one's identity. So then comes this question. Okay, if we're gonna talk about emerging adults and dig in more, I think we should really ask the question, so what does it mean to transition to adulthood? I think Arnett had some really specific thoughts about this, 
but I'd first like to start with a question for you and to have a little bit of participation. So for you, both with your clients and your own experience, but with those in your life, throughout your lifetime, how do you define when the transition to adulthood has occurred? Or to you, who is an adult? And I just like to take a moment and because I'm not quite technologically savvy, you can feel free to just like jump in as you wish, unmute yourself um, and go. So I'll say that for the vast majority of older clients I work with, and I will admit that I'm guilty of this too, it's uh, an age number, it's 18. Because mm -hmm. I had parents that said when you're 18, you're out. Like that's what adulthood is. You can serve and die for your country, so you're an adult. And I, I find that my approach has changed a little bit to that you are at a maturational state where you are prepared for some level of independence. Mm -hmm. the problem that I have having worked in transitional care before coming here is that there's some emerging adults who will stay in emerging adulthood till their 50s <laughs> and like never get to that point. So at some point you do have to say like you have to get a little bit of a kick in the butt mm -hmm. and get out there. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say that uh, my theory is a big part of lifespan expanding like even 100 years ago at 14 you'd be uh, having kids and like working the farms and nowadays people going off to college and even grad school i think maturation really stunts us a little bit <laughs> we're still reliant upon loans our mom and dad government paying us mm -hmm. uh, that it's no longer an age number but some mm -hmm. state of not just financial but also like executive functioning and core decision making independence from parents mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank you michael i appreciate that what about others for you, what does it mean to be an adult or when does adulthood take place? I'm just going to say two of the things that Michael said too, which the first thing that came to mind was financial independence. So not relying on, on others for finances um, and having kind of some set of um, like skills there and confidence there. And then the other one I was going to say is decision-making. So not relying on other people to even if they're not making a decision for you, like kind of basically making a decision for you um, about life choices. Mm -hmm. so the two that jump out for me. Yeah. Thank you. What about others? Anyone else want to share? I feel like it's so easy. Like I keep coming up with ideas and then immediately coming up with like groups that don't fit with that idea. Like I'm thinking about, you know, sort of culturally, maybe groups where it's normal to live with your family of origin until you get married, if you get married and maybe that's 21 and maybe that's 31 or, you know, folks who don't really have relationships with their family of origin. And so I think it's hard because they're the exceptions are still like fairly large segments of this age range population. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I think hearing you all talk, uh, I guess this is going to be an understatement, but it's complicated, right? And I imagine, again, going back to this theory. So this, this is a developmental theory. And I imagine for us as clinicians, we might have other experiences and ideas and thoughts about what it's like to work with our emerging adult clients. And, you know, I appreciated what Michael was saying that, you know, sometimes uh, people in their 50s could look like emerging adults. And so what I'll say about um, answering this question now and getting back to our next theory, we'll have some time in the end to reflect on how this fits and doesn't fit. Again, I really think it's a useful framework, um, but he does have quite specific ideas about what it means to be an adult and thus sort of what emerging adulthood is. And so I'll ask for your openness and hearing these perspectives. And at the end, we'll reflect more about how it works, how it doesn't work for you as a clinician. Okay. Um, so getting back, what I'll say is, um, Really traditionally, what had been known as the adulthood years had been defined by achievements or a series of concrete goals. So those included finishing one's education, leaving home, finding work, finding a life partner, and having children. 
And so Arnett really in his theory argues that these parameters for adulthood are too limited and they're too externally focused to truly describe what it means to be a full-fledged adult. Um, he says that instead it's more about one's internal subjective experience, though he does reference one observable quality. And um, it'll be interesting on my next slide to kind of compare some of the things that were said to what Arnett posits. So again, for Arnett, the experience of becoming an adult is an internal experience or shift and not an observable quality or not just an observable quality. The internal experiences and shifts that lead one to become an adult, according to Arnett, are first, accepting responsibility for oneself, and then second, making independent decisions. From these internal experiences or shifts really come a sense of self-sufficiency uh, for the adult. Because these experiences are internal, Emerging adulthood is really seen as a process that each young person traverses on his or her, her own individual life path through the stage. So the conclusion of emerging adulthood comes at different times for different people. Um, and he would say, hence the 18 to 25 or 18 to 29 range. Yet, if you read a little bit more deeply, there are some arguments that, well, yeah, emerging adulthood can still um, be possible for the 30 year old um, plus. Um, but in terms of one observable quality that Arnett points to, becoming financially independent is also what signifies becoming an adult. So, turning back to emerging adulthood and digging deeper into the theory, Arnett describes five defining characteristics of emerging adulthood. These are identity exploration, instability, self-focus, feeling in between, and experiencing a range of possibilities. When you hear these characteristics, which I'm going to describe further in the next few slides, you could consider how many of these define other developmental periods. Uh, and they do. They can be experienced at other times during the lifespan. But Arnett would propose that they're not likely to be experienced with the same intensity and pervasiveness as the 18 to 25 or 18 to 29 period. Uh, we're going to go on to review these defining characteristics, as well as their associated self-knowledge goals, which are questions the emerging adult must grapple with, and then tasks related to these goals. Uh, identity exploration. Uh, emerging adulthood is defined by identity exploration. Emerging adults explore various possibilities as they move toward making enduring choices. Through trying out different possibilities, emerging adults develop a more definite identity. Exploration can span love. Partners begin to choose each other for enduring reasons like values, goals, the potential for long-term satisfaction, work. Um, emerging adults begin to envision the remainder of their life and how work might fit into that larger picture. Emerging adults explore world worldviews, finding their own unique identity by breaking away from the ideas of their childhood and adolescence and testing out their parental figure's values. Emerging adults must explore and come to an understanding of their capabilities and limitations. And finally, they must explore and consider how to construct a life. So the self-knowledge goals related to identity exploration are asking oneself, who am I and what do I value? And the related task is to clarify values and beliefs. Emerging adulthood is also defined by instability. Emerging adults must endure a great amount of change that is inherent in this life stage. It's really their natural explanation, explorations and behaviors that create instability. Instability can encompass work, 
if you think about changes in employment, changes in career goals, getting hired, getting fired during this period, and stability in romantic partnerships and friendships, friendships are made, romantic, romantic relationships start, breakups happen, academic pursuits, deciding to or not to attend college, changes in majors, choosing to transfer, using for, moving from community college to a four-year institution, deciding to attend graduate school, and then instability and in geographical location, repeated changes in residence, taking a gap year and traveling, moving to college from home, living with friends or romantic partner, moving back home, uh, moving for a career, moving to pursue a romantic relationship. With all of this that I just mentioned, it's really clear that so much is in flux for the emerging adult. Self-knowledge goals related to instability include asking them oneself the question, what path most suits me? And the related task is explore a variety of living situations, jobs, partners, and educational goals. Another defining characteristic of emerging adulthood is self-focus. The emerging adult's main responsibility is to oneself. Now, going back to a bit of what I shared about Arnett um, and his appreciation for emerging adults, Arnett really focused on breaking down stereotypes of emerging adults. So he argued that self-focus during this period is normal, healthy, and temporary. Emerging adults are not self-centered or egocentric. And it's really that the exploration that's occurring during this period requires self-focus and self-examination. Self-focus allows for learning how to be self-sufficient through developing knowledge, skills, and self-understanding. Self-focus is also necessary before committing to enduring relationships and love and work. Emerging adults really need to look inward and focus on themselves first to become adults. So the self-knowledge goals related to self-focus are, what do I want and what will make me happy? The related task is develop goals and relationships based on personal preferences. Emerging adulthood is defined by the, also the feeling of being in between Emerging adults feel not adolescent and not fully adult. Garnett pointed to that a primary indicator of this from his research was that when asked a, the question, do you feel that you've reached adulthood? The majority of emerging adults responded neither yes nor no, but with the ambiguous in some ways yes and in some ways no. Uh, if you think about it, they're in this sort of limbo. Their old identity is starting to shed as a new one is formed. So they're really in this between space. Emerging adults may feel unlike a real adult because they've left their family of origin, but they don't have a family of one's own. They've moved frequently and they're not geographically identified. They may be dating, but haven't yet committed to marriage or a long-term partnership. They can make decisions of their own, but they're not fully self-sufficient. And perhaps they've started higher education, but haven't finished. All of this leads emerging adults to have the subjective feeling of being in a transitional period of life. They're on the way to adulthood, but they're not quite there. The self-knowledge goals related to feeling in between are, in what ways am I ready to take responsibility for my life? And in what ways am I ready to commit to others? And the related task is transition to a greater sense of independence with more responsibility for the self. The final defining characteristic of emerging adulthood is experiencing a range of possibilities. Emerging adulthood can be a really exciting time because many futures remain possible for the emerging adult. And until choices are made, lots of possibilities remain open. For some, these possibilities can be associated with optimism. Emerging adults can have high hopes for the future because little has been decided. 
For others, it can be associated with an unwillingness to make choices that close doors. With all the choices that the emerging adult can make, there's so many dilemmas that are possible. And sometimes people in this age group can just be marking time, feeling confused, and feeling paralyzed while they try to figure out who they are. Now, all of these possibilities can also be experienced as associated with disappointment. Sometimes when the dreams and ideals of the emerging adult are tested, they may be faced with the realities of their limitations. Also, some of the beliefs that they had as a child and adolescent that they could be whoever they wanted to be and whatever they wanted to be if they tried hard enough starts to fade away. And this is disappointing. So the associated self-knowledge goals of, related to experiencing a range of possibilities include what kind of life do I wish to have? And what kind of person do I wish to be? And the related task is to make decisions about life's path, choosing from the many possibilities that present. So now that you have an idea of who emerging adults are and how to describe emerging adulthood, I wanna take a moment to discuss, discuss criticisms of Arnett's theory and his thoughts about how his theory applies across cultures. So Arnett, Arnett posits emerging adulthood can be said to exist wherever there's a gap of at least a few years between the end of puberty and the entry into stable adult roles in love and work. But I think that there are some key objections that we should consider. So the first is, one, um, emerging adulthood is only experienced by those whose circumstances like SES, social supports, and certain life events allow them an extended period of self-focus. And two, another criticism being that emerging adulthood is not universal. It's not experienced by all. When thinking about this, um, I came back to Arnett's research and really he does a good job of acknowledging the ways in which emerging adulthood can vary according to privilege, culture, and experience. But he really firmly argues that his theory is generally representative of American emerging adults. He points to his studies that found no significant differences in the subjective experiences of emerging adults in terms of the find of five defining characteristics that I just mentioned, even when circumstances may require the emerging adult to take on adult roles. However, he also suggests that the five defining characteristics may not apply equally to all emerging adults. For example, some emerging adults might be more self-focused and some emerging adults may experience less of a sense of instability. I really will have you think about some of these criticisms uh, for when we get to the end of the presentation to share your own criticisms and reactions and if you feel like Arnett's arguments hold. Okay. Moving into the second half of what I hope to share with you, I'm going to share some treatment considerations for your work with emerging adults. Um, bringing together the defining characteristics of emerging adulthood there's a lot to consider in terms of what we can do to be effective clinicians. Um, there's just so much to say here that I really can't do really justice to the many clinical issues that arise during emerging adulthood. We could talk about college student experiences, we could talk about substance use, we could talk about trauma, we could talk about brain changes. Um, but instead, what I've chosen to do is to really ground some of my proposed treatment interventions in terms of Arnett's theory. I'm gonna share some very general treatment considerations for you to take forward with you and your work. Um, in bold, over the next few slides, I'll have a highlighted key point about emerging adulthood. I'll then suggest several associated treatment strategies for working with your clients. Um, I will offer though a resource for you. Um, if you do want to dig in and refine your understanding of emerging adulthood and how to work with this population effectively, 
I encourage you to read um, a very new book entitled Emerging Adults in Therapy, How to Strengthen Your Clinical Competency by Martinez and Kahn. Um, this is listed in my reference list and I will send out a PDF of the slides after I finish my presentation. Um, this book was just published over the past summer and I think it's incredibly helpful, particularly because um, it incorporates some recent research on the impact of the pandemic. Okay. So moving on to talking about treatment, um, when thinking about our work with emerging adults, we as clinicians must challenge any notions we have about the 18 to 25 or 29 period being a developmental downtime. We also need to do this with our clients. So this idea of the developmental downtime um, is really uh, credited to the clinical psychologist, Neg J. Um, I really appreciate her work. She specializes in therapy with 20 somethings um, and authored a book called The Defining Decade. I appreciate how she thinks about how important it is to capitalize on this time and to not let ourselves think or clients think that the emerging adulthood can be uh, developmental downtime at all. So what I hope you to take away in terms of thinking about treatment, both for you and for your clients, is that the time during emerging adulthood is an opportunity to do something that adds value to who you are. This is really something um, that Jay highlighted in her book. Emerging adults can be making choices that are investments in who they want to be and what they want to do next, even if they're not there yet. So how do we do this in treatment? Um, I'm gonna propose two treatment strategies. So the first is encouraging exploration that counts. So when emerging adults are exploring love, work, identity, and other parts of themselves and their lives, I think it's really important to encourage not just exploration for exploration's sake, but also encourage exploration that is meaningful. Help emerging adults think about why they want to explore certain things or what they want next, which I think really kind of fits with the next proposed intervention, which is supporting intentional action versus thinking. So really helping our clients take action not just thinking about what they wanna do, which I think can take up a lot of space in therapy, but also helping them move on to taking intentional action. And by taking action, each move can be more intentional and more informed by the last. Another intervention, which I can't take credit for, but um, Jay proposes is helping clients create a timeline. Um, she discusses this with clients as a way to keep themselves honest about the future. So you have clients ask themselves questions like, at what age would I like to be out of a dead end job? By when do I hope to be married? How old do I wanna be when I try for my first child? How old do I wanna be when I try for the last child? She emphasizes to her clients that you don't have to etch any of this in stone, but it's just a way to think about your life and how it might or might not be adding up to what you want. And then it allows for further exploration or committed action. Finally, in this section, I just like to pause and think a little bit about uh, clinicians and how we can confront our own biases. Um, this goes back to Arnett. So in the media, emerging adults are often portrayed as self-centered, floundering, media saturated, lazy, narcissistic, and unwilling to accept adult responsibilities. While some of these might sound extreme, I think we as clinicians must consider what notions and stereotypes we have about the emerging adult population and how this impacts our work. Also, I think we should routinely ask ourselves, do we have any blind spots that might be allowing us to perceive emerging adulthood and the years 18 to 29 as a developmental downtime for our clients. I think that really gets in our way and I think it really does not serve our clients well. 
Um, in this next section, I'd like to talk a little bit about addressing anxiety and change. Emerging adulthood is a valuable time to learn how to become comfortable with being uncomfortable. I think this is a key point that I'd like you to take away and like you to share with your clients. When you think about it, identity exploration, instability, and feeling in between are all examples of high uncertainty, which is especially likely to create anxiety. Becoming comfortable with being uncomfortable is necessary. However, a remarkable amount of flexibility, humor, patience, faith, and courage is needed to master this. I really think that some of this can be cultivated in treatment. And I think some of this is what we support our clients in doing. I think we can really help our clients learn through therapy to adapt and cope in the face of change. I think we can do this lots and lots of ways. And I imagine sort of our own theories of how therapy works guide us but I'll suggest some treatment strategies to, to generally help us think about this. Um, so the first is teaching mindfulness skills. Um, in a really basic way, mindfulness skills can be used to quiet anxiety and just decrease distress. Um, when thinking about this treatment strategy, I really look to the world of college student mental health um, and more specifically the Coral Mindfulness Program. Coral mindfulness is an evidence-based curriculum for emerging adults developed at Duke University. Um, their randomized controlled trial found that their mindfulness program led to an improvement in perceived stress, sleep problems, mindfulness in daily life, and self-compassion for young adults. The Coral program suggests really that mindfulness is wisdom practice. Um, and that wisdom and self-understanding begin to grow when we start to pay attention to the moment by moment movements of our mind. This wisdom can support emerging adults as they move through the anxieties and changes that occur during this period for them. While Koro is taught in a group format, I think we can translate some of what works from this intervention into our individual work by uh, talking about mindfulness as a practical skill. They highlight that as something that's central to their program. Providing psychoeducation about why mindfulness is relevant and giving homework that allows emerging adults to practice in very small manageable doses. I think next in our work in terms of a treatment strategy, I think it's really important to address the link between anxiety and avoidance. This is something that I often talk to my clients about over and over and over again. Um, I think just explaining to them how anxiety and avoidance are connected and how avoidance just leads to more anxiety and more avoidance. And I think I often say this because we want our clients to explore. We want our clients to be trying new things as any limitations on their exploration can lead to following the status quo or following the expectations of others, which can really limit identity development. I think psychoeducation on anxiety and avoidance can help our clients understand that change is really what strengthens the muscle of cognitive flexibility. And it helps emerging adults define how how, what he or she wants and does not want to be cognitively flexible and to try new things. And this can really encourage emerging adults who are floundering or experiencing paralysis to really move forward in taking action. I think finally, when thinking about anxiety and change, it's really important to use the framework of grief and loss. Emerging adults are inevitably experiencing losses whether it's like the loss of possibilities when decisions are made or it's the loss or crisis around personal values when they realize that their values might differ from what they learned when growing up. There's also so many losses, the loss of a partnership, the loss of place, the loss of educational institution, et cetera, that happens during this period. So really being able to dig in and process and understand the grief that's experienced is really important. So a final consideration I'd like to talk about is how we can promote resilience. 
Um, emerging adulthood can be seen as a critical period for resilience. I'd like you and your clients to understand that the emerging adult's decisions can really shape their life's direction. It's notable that emerging adults may have the ability to leave unhealthy and high-risk environments, including that of the family of origin, more than individuals at other times might. Many emerging adults may not have yet made commitments that structure adult life. So during this period, there's high potential for making decisions that can turn life around and move it toward a new and better direction. These decisions can be like choosing military service, healthier romantic relationships, pursuing higher education, developing religious faith, and finding meaningful work opportunities. So what can we do to support this? I think we can provide psychoeducation and support planful competence. I think educating clients about emerging adulthood as a period in which they can make significant changes that shapes life course is so important. I think we can also help them understand planful competence, which really refers to an individual's ability to choose roles that are well-suited to their interests and talents, and to pursue these roles effectively and with perseverance. I think we can promote healthy relationships. Um, for our clients, we know that it is the quality of their relationships with other people that influences how emotionally resilient they can be. So we can help our clients learn how to build healthy relationships and seek out people who care about them. We can help our clients develop an awareness of their strengths and limitations. We want them to know what their strengths are. We also want emerging adults to learn to practice acceptance and an understanding that they're becoming who they're meant to be to the best of their abilities and that they have limitations. And ultimately, I think therapy can be a place where emerging adults can develop, it can help clients develop a realistic view of themselves. And finally, I think we can work to normalize the developmental challenges and tasks of this period. I think this really helps support individuals who are grappling with insecurities and the many questions of this period, like, am I good enough? Am I normal? And where do I belong? Which are very scary questions. And I think ones that we support through our work. So I started this presentation really with framing it as an introduction. And uh, I've left some time for us to discuss at the end what I've shared. And I have a few questions for you on the next slide for us to consider. Um, as I hope to get you to get to know me more, I would like to get to know you more through your work with emerging adults. Um, but first I'll end this presentation with a bit of my own reflection on emerging adulthood. Um, I imagine that there's something quite exciting and challenging about each life stage. However, I do think that there's something powerful about this period because the emerging adults are changing so much. I think through this change that they're going through, they can be receptive to the process of therapy and they can make a lot of progress in just a little bit of time. I really hope that something I've shared today sticks with you and serves you well in your work with emerging adult clients, or at least that I've made you more willing to consider further expanding your skills and working with this population. So as we end, I'll turn to some questions. Um, I have them here and I don't really feel committed to doing them in any order. I think more, I want them to serve as a little bit of a framework for us to talk together, for you to share your reactions to the presentation and for you to just dig in a little bit around what you find works and doesn't work with your clients. If I could chime in, it's Julie. Hi, Casey. Thank you Hi. so much. This is great. Uh, we're so lucky to have you. I'm okay. I'm interested in kind of like themes that you see because I hear a lot and I think there's a lot in pop culture and just out there about generational differences. Like, you know, I guess I was an emerging adult. Oh, this is sad, 25 years ago. <laughs> um, but the idea is that now 
it, that looks a little different because 25 years and we were looking at so many changes in society and our culture. And I, sometimes I hear stereotypes that really don't favor emerging adults. And I guess, what are you noticing and what are the challenges with that for that population now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that there are many stereotypes that we hold about emerging adults. Um, I think that, that they're Floundering, I, I think, is one a stereotype which probably can fit a long time ago and can fit now. Um, and I think, really, in that stereotype, I challenge it by kind of going back to some of what Arnett proposes that it's really they're not floundering, they're exploring, and they need to sort of try out things and fail and then try things again and fail to continue to refine their understanding of both who they are, what they want what they're good at. And, you know, I highlighted it a few times in thinking about resilience that there is something important in understanding one's limitations. I think a little bit about like DBT and that that's something that is often talked about there. I think that there is like in understanding one's limitations, emerging adults can have a realistic sense of themselves and then can thus like make choices aligned with that. And so then can be a little bit more, um, able to be confident in what they choose and what they choose to do next. Um, and some of my reading and prep for this presentation, of course, the things that come up are like social media. And I think that what I'd say is like social media is a double-edged sword. Um, in some ways, social media does lead the emerging adult to make a lot of comparisons um, and can lead and, and to more anxiety, more experiences of depression. And at the same time, it can be this really powerful tool of connection. Um, and so I think that's, that's there. But yeah, I would say um, the last thing that's coming to mind for me immediately in terms of trends, um, and I was thinking and putting this presentation together about working with one of my, my clients, this idea of returning home. I think that that has recently changed, particularly through the pandemic, this idea of returning home and returning to one's family. And I think that there is like, there's both. I, for some that there's like a little bit more acceptance of and tolerance of this. And then I think for others, there can still be a good bit of anxiety about what it means about them and the ways in which it sort of like blocks um, for the emerging adult, their idea of like progressing toward adulthood. Um, yeah, I think that that was like a, a varied answer, but there, I mean, there's so much there in terms of what's happening now and um, like so much to be thought about in terms of working with this population. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi, Casey, uh, great talk. Uh, I I want to pick your brain on um, how you approach whether a problem is clinical, whether it's a psychopathology, or whether it is a kind of general, uh, I guess, identity development, less psychopathology question, and, and whether or not, I, I mean, I've always found that's useful for me in working with this population, but whether or not... Uh, uh, you find that useful or what you do in terms of differentiating psychopathology mm -hmm. from something more, I guess, counseling or, or general? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think that this is a really hard and nuanced question um, because the, the line isn't always clear. And I think what I go back to um, are some of the things I shared. So I shared a general framework for kind of what again, through the theory of Arnett, like what he proposes emerging adults experience. And like, if you put that together, uh, they are gonna flounder a lot and they are going to be really anxious. But I think what I would really look to is like um, really like getting to some of the basics of like, okay, like level of functioning. Are they adaptable? Are they actually able to kind of like uh, like, do they seem like they're making those steps and progressing toward what we would call adulthood? Are they sort of like trying out and playing with these ideas in a purposeful way? Or do they just seem like stuck and not moving and overcome by 
anxiousness or overwhelm or possibility um, such that they can't even see the way through any of these questions. And, you know, I think we work with both. I think that we work with emerging adults who are going through really normative experiences that are just hard. Like all of this is hard. I, you know, I think I was reflecting a little bit in the beginning, like I was working with an emerging adult as an emerging adult. And that was uh, really informative to me, but it is a quite a challenging period. And on the other hand, I think in working in college counseling for such a long time, it's amazing to see in such little time with a bit of like guidance and direction, how many people are able to kind of like take these ideas and even take some normalizing of the period and use it to make steps that move them forward, whereas others um, know that they, they just get stuck or they get lost or their functioning is just really impaired by all of this and by, of course, like other mental health concerns that may be outside of um, just the experience of what it means to be an emerging adult. No, that tracks with me. I guess, uh, so to follow up on that, do you then find, um, like for someone for whom, you, you know, they're having experiences, they're trying to figure it out, they're stuck, uh, you, you try to normalize, and they, do you find that people in, in this kind of population that it's almost upsetting to be told that this is kind of normal, right? That that these young people want a diagnosis, right? They kind of want to be pathologized in a way that isn't accurate, right? So I guess, could you speak to the, the flip side of, of that? I actually like that. So yeah, uh, where my mind goes, and I don't know if your, your mind is going there, but yeah, I think that there are some emerging adults who come into therapy especially. And I think I maybe like have a little bit more privilege now, no longer being an emerging adult, but like fix me, help me, like tell me the thing I do to make this not hurt or to zoom my way through this period. So yeah, I think that there are some who are almost wanting to over pathologize their pretty normal developmental experience just because if they do that, there's this perception of like, well, I can fix it. Um, and I think that that's why I really appreciate and why I highlighted um, Koru and some of the impact of mindfulness, right? Cause like, it's okay, it's like being where you are now, you know, I think that there is sort of like um, this process of like acceptance that comes with mindfulness. And so, um, yeah, to your point, I like that question. Like, yeah, I think that there are some uh, clients who come and are just like, want you to tell them what's wrong and how to fix it and like wrap it up with a bow and do it in, you know, three sessions and send them on there. Can I just say too, because I've thought about this too, and Dave, I don't know if this has come up for you. It's a little anecdotal, but the idea that there's kind of I guess movements, if you will, on social media where groups are being created around identifying as ADHD or on the spectrum. So then sort of community gets made around having a diagnosis. And so there's a lot of attachment to that. And kind of to your point about that's an age in which you wanna be connected to community. So if there's connection around that, you know, there's gonna be resistance to wait, no, you're not, you know, you don't have ADHD or whatever it is. So. I just think I, in the, and again, this is anecdotal, but I'm curious if people are seeing that or you see that sort of attachment to a diagnosis for that reason. Or is that what you are seeing, Dave? Oh yeah, I mean, I see that. I, and I, I take your point about community though. There are times that it's not, I mean, maybe it's about community in the abstract, but sometimes people bristle from the start before the community has already been set. So I, hmm. I, I just, I'm not sure what to do about that sometimes. I would, I would agree uh, with some of what you're saying, Julie. Like, I think, especially in my time at Bowdoin, there are many times when um, I would see students really looking for community and a diagnosis or in their experience or even like, um, like looking for community and coming to the counseling center. I think some students wanted that, that like it was kind of their entry point into like conversation or fitting in in this strange way. And we would often sort of as a group be talking about like, you know, in this like, I'm 
don't want to go into sort of like a tangent about um, college mental health, but you know, um, I think college counseling centers now are really packed. So to have students who are coming in who are experiencing like very normal challenges and who are just like looking, looking, looking to be heard is both like what population the college counseling center serves. And at the same time, uh, being so overwhelmed, it would be really, really hard to sit with those students when you have other students who were experiencing much more acute concerns who really needed support. But I think definitely um, I've seen many times um, individuals really looking for either a diagnosis or community or group or using counseling as kind of like an entry point to say, oh, I go to counseling so I can share with you uh, then like who I am or what I'm like or what I'm struggling with. And that almost like, um, you know, being in therapy was a stamp for them to like justify, okay, like uh, I have this thing so I can tell you about it rather than feeling like um, they could be naturally vulnerable with their peers. Mm -hmm. We've got time for one, maybe more short thought or question. Um, this has been so great so far. I wish we had three more hours to talk about this. Yeah, no, I'm just gonna throw this one out there. It probably won't be a short answer, but um, I was thinking of the idea of exploration in terms of love and healthy relationships and wondering if you have come across more commonly this idea of polyamory and ethical non-monogamy because I'm seeing that a lot in a lot of this population that I see, even people who are already married within the, like, the emerging adulthood age range. Um, so I guess, you know, my question is more like in terms of making exploration count, like it kind of came up for me when you were talking about that. Um, like, what does that look like in terms of like the love and relationships piece um, mm -hmm. with this kind of newer, um, maybe it's not newer, but like it's more obviously popularized now and, and more yeah. of a yeah. reasonable choice. Yeah, I would say that it is, um, it is something that I've been, I would say maybe in the past, like, three years or so talking about more with my emerging adult clients. And I can say that I do not feel like I have any expertise necessarily um, on polyamorous relationships. But I would say I think maybe at the heart of your question, I go back to um, Meg Jai, who I referenced um, in one of my slides, and that, and she's really the exploration that counts person. And so I think it, in terms of intervention, I'd be really digging in with clients of like, okay, like what is it about this uh, like partnership, this relationship, or like the individual partners within the relationship? What draws you to them? Like why them? How do they fit or with the, the vision of like, what you want from a relationship or partner as you go into the future, what works and what doesn't work. And so I think really coming at it from a non-judgmental place and really like digging into the client's values, both around relationships in general, around connection and what it is that they see both in the partnership broadly and in the individual connections that they have within the, the partnership and how it fits for them. Um, yeah, I would say that. Well, thank you all so much for your time and your participation. And um, I hope to get to know all of you a little bit more. This is definitely something that I'd love to chat and share. Um, but more than anything, it's been great to have you participate today. Yeah, thank you all for being here. Um, Next month, Chelsea will be presenting on treating post-trauma nightmares. So um, we'll see you all, hopefully many of you around the office um, and also next month. So take care. Thank you all. Thank you, Casey. Thanks, Casey. <clears throat>